And then I guess really there's a third kind of vine. I'm going to call it a wrapper. How about that? For example, wisteria and kiwi, which we prune pretty much the same. And with that, I want you to think of a boa constrictor. <laughs> they send out great big shoots that uh, wrap around whatever is available to hold themselves up. And these are different than uh, some of the other plants, other vines, because uh, you cut them back annually to a permanent framework. You don't whack it to the ground. You whack it to a permanent framework. And I'm just going to go over wisteria, and you should know you pr pretty much do the kiwi the same way. Then you have the wisteria. A wisteria is a very beautiful, beautiful plant, and it's also really scary. It's scary because it's dangerous, and it's a huge amount of work. Wisterias are famous for growing up and ripping off roofs, tearing up banisters, and smothering trees. And in fact, one of my teachers said wisteria is Latin for work. But you can't beat a wisteria for sheer beauty. This is one of my friend's pergola. Uh, she had a chain link fence with a wisteria on it that she bought it that way. And uh, the chain link fence wasn't very attractive, so she added this wood framework to it, which I think really dolls it up without having to destroy your wisteria. And once a year, it blooms these fabulous cascades of pea-like flowers that are purple and smell sweet. And uh, it doesn't look uh, any more like gracious living than this. Uh, this is what a wisteria vine looks like if it's been generally sort of properly pruned. This is mine. And I guess I would take off a few more of the runners, but um, that's pretty much the deal. This is what happens rather quickly if you don't prune your wisteria. There's actually a car in there somewhere, and this is not an uncommon sight. They are extremely aggressive, and we need to prune them so they don't wind up down the block but are kept right where they should be and that they don't develop the dead mattress underneath them and just bloom where you can't see them on top of the mattress. And this is a wisteria vine trunk. That's how big they get. And uh, this is a particularly big one, but it's not uncommon to see them as big around as your wrist uh, and certainly as big around as your calf. When the support has long rotted away, the wisteria trunk will still be there. But um, let's take it from the top. Let's talk about taking it from the time it is a young vine. This is an uh, illustration of my wisteria, which I wanted to train along the handrail on my porch and also to go up above my porch. And here I had just this one single strand. And when I brought it home, I tied it onto my porch. And you have to be careful to retie it periodically so you don't girdle it. And then there was this one whip or uh, shoot or whatever you want to call it coming out from the bottom, which I didn't want, so I cut that off and I tied the rest on. But because I needed part uh, a side branch to become the framework along the handrail, I headed it. Non-select, just whacked the tip off because I wanted to create some bushiness there. And the only way to do that is to cut it. So I cut it, and this is what came back. I got, you know, five new shoots, uh, one of which I tied down on the handrail, one of which I tied up so it would go farther up and start making the framework up above. I took off one of the whips because I just didn't need that much stuff, and I shortened one to about six inches because that helps it set up a flower system. I think of them as sort of like uh, fruit trees with a permanent spur system, and you want to encourage that, sort of like espaliering a fruit tree, and you do that by shortening one of these whips to turn it into part of the permanent framework. So here we have the permanent framework, and holy moly, here's a flower already. One of the most common comments I get from people is my wisteria doesn't bloom, and they're famous for not blooming. It can take them up to seven years to bloom, and sometimes they never bloom. And I took care of a very well-managed wisteria that never bloomed for this guy. We tried root pruning. 
Uh, we tried adding lime. We tried all kinds of stuff, and it never bloomed. Uh, so we just took it out. The uh, Roundup trick, cut and paint, used to be part of the wisteria section because, you know, you can't just cut it to the ground. It explodes into regrowth, and you have even more non-blooming wisteria. So um, let's take it from the top, the life of a flowering spur system. So uh, if you look at the upper left whip or shoot or runner, whatever you want to call it, you want to turn this into something that has flowers, you just whack it back. This illustration shows it being carefully whacked back to kind of a bud, but in reality, you don't look that close. You just whack it back. And when it's done, it looks like the upper right-hand one. Next year, you get a bunch more runners, and you cut those off. And the year after that, you get a bunch more runners, and you always cut a little bit further out. And where you do, it starts to set up what we call flowering buds as opposed to vegetative buds. Vegetative buds are smaller, and uh, they just turn into more whips, which turn into a bunch of foliage, which, you know, you really have enough. You don't want any more foliage. You want more flowers. And the big, fat, chubby buds on these little, short, chubby stems is what we're going for. Spur systems are what you make, make you think it's a fruit tree when you look at it in the winter. It's a permanent framework of modified short branches that have flowers, which is what we want is flowers because flowers are what turn into fruit on an apple tree and flowers are exactly what we want on our wisteria vine. So you do this for a few years and pretty soon you have this permanent, it's, it almost looks like a hand that has a bunch of those nice chubby flower buds on it. And every year, you're going to cut off and get this, 90% of the new growth, maybe 99% of the new growth, which are uh, these little skinny whips about the size of a telephone cord. Do we still have telephone cords? I'm sure they exist somewhere. And, uh, oh, a computer cord. How about that? And you cut all that stuff off every year. It's a huge amount of work. And you have to do it in the summer and you have to do it in the winter. But you're building up this framework, which persists year after year. So what starts out as a, as a whip will turn into a stem, and the stem turns into a trunk. And some of the other side branches will turn into um, what look like uh, hands to me. That's not a technical term. That's a Cass Turnbull term. So here we have the permanent framework, and this is all good, good stuff. This is what we want out of our wisteria. And this is it, just as the buds are starting to plump in April. And they get fatter. And they're starting to extend. Here we go. Almost there. Isn't that fabulous? I can hardly wait. It's spring right now at my house. The bees are going to love it too. So this is, this is what it is all for. But shortly after you have flowered, and sometimes even when you are flowering, the rest of your plant explodes into runners, also sometimes called whips. They look like this, and they are all over your plant from top to bottom. This is a simplified illustration. There would be a zillion more of these. And uh, they would also be covered in leaves. And this is just so you can kind of see what's going on. And those will explode all over your plant. And you have to cut them back all summer long just to keep them from destroying the world. Notice that the trunk does sort of twist and, and wrap around itself. I should... Uh, take a little moment to say that that's okay. A lot of pruning books I read say that you need to train it to a single trunk, and I think you'd have to stand out there with a flashlight at night to make sure that it didn't rope around itself. Roping around itself is perfectly okay, and I see many of them that look that way. Don't worry. They're not going to girdle themselves. But you don't want all these extraneous whips to uh, grab onto things. So they need to be cut back to the permanent framework during the summer. 
If you don't, this is what they do. They wrap and latch onto any nearby tree, shrub, or house part. And uh, they can go quite a ways. They know how to fly. They know how to leap. You got to be fast. Sleeping dogs can get strangled. I kid you not. You will be amazed at how fast these whips are growing. So you're going to have something that looks a little bit like this, except it's going to be worse. And you're going to have to get out and cut all those whips back. You can't cut back to any place in particular because you can't even see what's going on. There are so many leaves. So just get them out of the way for now, because if you leave them and you let them wrap around a branch and then you don't get it until after winter, they will harden up and be permanently attached to that branch. When they're young like this, they're very soft and they pull out and let go of whatever they're wrapping around. But if you let them stay over winter, they harden off and become woody and then they won't let go. So during the summer, as often as once every two weeks, you're going to be going out uh, with your lopper and your pole pruner to cut these off. This is a picture of my wisteria vine after it has been pruned. It looks kind of like a feather boa. It would be twice this massive if I wasn't pruning on it all the time. This is a very handy tool. This is called a uh, long reach pruner, and it's different than a regular pole pruner because it's extremely light. And it works with sort of a scissors action, has a nice clean cut. It will only cut that soft wood and actually the very thinnest of uh, a woodier stem. It is not for your laurel hedge. It is only for grapes and wisteria vines and other soft wooded young plants. But this can save you a considerable amount of time and ladder work if you have one of these. It costs about 80 bucks, not cheap, but, but well worth it. This is the same long reach pruner and it is uh, extended. They also have ones that have kind of a grabber so that you can actually grab something and try to drag it out of whatever it's climbing on. I get my ARS long reach pruners from AM Leonard Tool Catalog. It's very hard to find good pruning tools. If you know what you want, the AM Leonard Tool Catalog is a dream and you can get things a little bit cheaper. And they, of course, are online as well, amleo.com. And then you do your real pruning, your major pruning in the winter, which is December. Basically, your wisteria is one of the last plants to drop its leaves, so you can't get in there to see what's going on until December. But there's one sunny, cool day in December when you can get out and do the final pruning for the year. See all these straight shoots? Those are all the whips, and they all have to be cut off back to the framework or to the trunk or back to one of those hands. I call it training. This is one of my employees. I always say, you want to learn how to prune a wisteria? Good. Let me show you. And see all these runners or whips down at the base? I have seen these go under the porch and come out the other side. One actually went up that downspout and came out the top. So uh, you cannot let these rest, and you certainly don't want to let them tip root, which they will do sometimes. That's a real nightmare. So you have to cut everything off. All these whips get to be taken off, and you get back to your clean framework. And this is what I mean by your clean framework. And just a word about arbors and trellises. Uh, wisterias really are extremely strong. And they will make quick work of, out of your little cute white trellis uh, and just rip it up. So you need to build a framework which is very strong, strong enough to hold your weight because you're going to be walking along the top of it. So this is the trellis that we built for one of my customers. And notice that these posts are strong enough. You should be able to walk across the top. If you let your wisteria build on top of itself, then the flowers won't dangle beautifully from the trellis. Uh, that will be the mattress of dead branches, and it will just keep reaching higher and higher and farther and farther out, and you'll have fewer blooms that you can enjoy. We have radically renovated 
uh, wisterias by whacking them back to a framework and then staying on top of those whips and training new hands uh, takes an incredible level of commitment. This is like black belt gardening. People walk by my house when they see my wisteria blooming and think it's so beautiful. And and my customers say something to me like, I really want a wisteria. And I say, you can't have a wisteria because very few people have the money and the will to deal with it. This customer did. And you want to build this trellis as far away from anything it can jump on. Way, don't nestle it in the shrubs and trees. Put it way in the middle where there's nothing around. In fact, some people actually train their wisteria as a little tree in the middle of the lawn where they can get all the way around it and it can't get into trouble. I think the very smartest trellis is made of pipe sunk in concrete with an elbow. And uh, that pipe is so strong that it will actually be able to carry the weight of a very large old wisteria and the person who's walking across the trellising pruning it. Uh, but people don't like the look of pipe. It's not very attractive. So then you can zip tie your pretty white trellis to it, and that will help um, hold up your wisteria and look good until it, it completely wraps and hides that pipe. That's my best advice. And then sit back and enjoy it when it blooms because there is truly nothing more lovely than a wisteria in bloom. That's my wisteria in bloom. That's my cat, Boo Boo, and that's a little stone cat by him. I probably wouldn't put this on my house again, but now that it's there, I do devote my time and attention for this wonderful effect. So looky here, here's a picture of trees. This is, in fact, the most important slide in the slideshow, brought to you by the Urban and Community Forestry People. Uh, and it is going to save the lives of thousands of trees because the picture on the left is the imagined tree roots. This is the picture we have in our heads of where the tree roots are. And if they are deep and look like this, they're very hard to get to and very hard to hurt. But this is not how tree roots really are. They are actually like the illustration on the right. Most of the anchoring roots are in the top three feet, and most of the absorbing roots are in the top three inches. And it is very easy to kill a tree. It just takes seven years for it to die. After you have driven all over the roots, excavated two feet uh, to put in your new patio or trench to put in your new irrigation system or your new utility, you can inadvertently cut off all the roots of your tree and you won't realize it. And when the tree dies six years later, you don't put the two together. But from here on out, you will have the correct picture in your head. Thank you, DNR and USDA. And that's pretty much it for vines and climbers. I work with Plant Amnesty to end the senseless torture and mutilation of trees and shrubs caused by malpruning. I uh, hope you enjoy this as well as our other DVDs and PowerPoint presentations. We are here to help. Thank you.